Santa Claus, the tooth fairy, an honest lawyer, and a kung fu master are walking down the street when they spot a hundred dollar note. Who gets it? Well, the kung fu master, of course. The other three are make-believe. Like it or lump it, if you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to have to get used to lawyer jokes. Everyone hates us until they need us. The interesting thing about lawyer jokes, though, is that they centre on two themes. That lawyers are greedy and that lawyers are dishonest. If all you knew about lawyers came from those jokes, well, you could be forgiven for thinking that lawyers were a horrible pe breed of people indeed. You'd certainly wonder why anyone would study the law in order to become one. The truth is that while there are obviously some lawyers out there who are greedy or dishonest or incompetent, our profession is in fact the profession of justice. And lawyers are bound by a range of professional rules which makes it so that any lawyer who really did behave in the way that those jokes describe would very quickly be struck off the rolls and removed from the profession. So what does it mean to be a lawyer? G'day everyone, my name's Anthony Maranak and welcome to module five of our introduction to law. This is the final module of this introductory subject and the whole module is about how the law affects people in the real world. We start by looking at lawyers. How do you become one? How's the profession arranged? We're then going to look at the relationship which Indigenous Australians have with the law, both as a result of history and of contemporary challenges. In the third video in this module, we'll look at Australian women's experience of the law. And then in the final video in this module, we'll look at the relationship between lesbian, gay, bi, transgender and intersex people and the law. Why do we look at these groups? Well, there's dozens of other social groups that could have been selected, but those are three important groups with long and complicated legal histories. And by looking at the way Indigenous Australians, women and LGBTI people experience the law, you'll hopefully be encouraged to think about how other groups within our society experience the law. At the very least, I'd like you to reflect on the possibility that in many ways, equality before the law is a polite fiction. We may all be subject to the same laws, but they affect us in very different ways. So let's start by thinking about lawyers. Well, you've already heard me refer to lawyers as a profession. What do we mean when we talk about a profession or a professional? In sports, a professional is just anyone who plays for money. It's the opposite of an amateur. And because the word has that meaning, we've all crept into the habit of using the word professional whenever we talk about any sort of paid employment. So we talk about professional gamblers and professional plumbers and professional bludgers. There is, however, a more precise meaning for the word profession. The professions are a few particular occupations, such as doctors and lawyers and architects. They're characterised by three things. First, you need to obtain a certain amount of learning in order to enter a profession, a bachelor's degree at the very least. So the professions are learned occupations. And without those qualifications, it is unlawful to do the work of those professions. So you can't just decide to practice as a lawyer or as a doctor. Second, the professions are self-regulating. So in the profession of law, practitioners must follow all the rules established by the Law Society for solicitors and the Bar Association for barristers. If you don't follow their rules and they don't issue you with a practicing certificate, then guess what? You can't practice. Third, and most importantly, the professions are required to regulate themselves according to the concept of service. Contrary to what people believe, lawyers are not allowed to just be mercenary and in it for the money. The nature of our profession is that we collectively aim to perform a service for the community. This is why so many lawyers perform what is called pro bono or pro bono publico work where they actually charge nothing at all for people who have worthy cases but who cannot afford legal representation. 
This is why so many lawyers volunteer their time at community legal centres and the Prisoners Legal Service and Salvo's Legal Humanitarian and the Women's Legal Centre and the Refugees Legal Service and a dozen others, all for free. This is why firms take on legal aid work where the fees that they are paid are much, much lower than the fees paid by private clients. It's very easy for people to knock lawyers, but service is the heart of our profession. Service is what makes us a profession. Please don't forget that. So what exactly is a legal practitioner? Well, in Australia, the profession is divided into three basic elements. Solicitors, barristers and judicial officers. Most people start their career as solicitors. Solicitors are members of and are regulated by the Law Society in their state or territory. Solicitors are the ones that most clients will see first and they do an incredible range of work. First and foremost, solicitors provide advice. They listen to a client's concern or problem and then they work with that client on a customised solution to the problem. Whether it's conveyancing for a house sale or writing a will or setting up the partnership arrangements for a business or writing a letter of demand in a contract dispute or providing initial advice to someone charged with a criminal offence or helping an employer to work out their obligations towards an employee they're having a dispute with or advising the government about new laws or the operation of old ones. Honestly, I could keep on going for the rest of this whole video and still not come to the end of what solicitors do. Solicitors are the most numerous of our legal practitioners and many solicitors appear in court, especially in the Magistrates Court and in the Federal Circuit Court. Solicitors accompany clients to mediations and they might accompany clients to police interviews. Now because the range of matters that a solicitor might handle is so broad, most solicitors find themselves working in a particular area of the law and they develop a greater understanding of that area of law. So they might end up knowing little or nothing about other areas. And so most law societies have specific systems to allow practitioners to become accredited specialists in an area of law. But many solicitors have long and distinguished careers without seeking a specialisation. How about barristers then? Barristers are specialists in courtroom advocacy. You see, 90% of cases never go anywhere near a court. They're resolved by solicitors or by negotiation or by agreement or by mediation. And then even if a matter does go to court, often it will be resolved in the magistrate's court. If things get more serious than that, though, the parties will often engage a barrister. Barristers have two main functions. First and foremost, they represent their clients in court. Second, they often provide written advice to solicitors about the prospects of a matter once it gets to court, or the sufficiency of the evidence which the solicitor has available. In each state, barristers have their own organisation called the Bar Association. To join the Bar Association and be, as they say, called to the bar, you must first be a solicitor, and you must then usually complete a further course and examinations. In the higher courts you will know the barristers from the way they dress. Long black robes, a bar jacket and jabot which looks a bit like a white bib, and the white horsehair wig on their head. In some states they've done away with the robes and wigs which I think is a bit of a pity, but in other states the robes and the wig are the traditional signature of a barrister. Barristers are referred to as counsel, so if Mr Smith is a barrister he might be referred to as Mr Smith of Counsel. The most senior barristers are known informally as Silks and it's said that they have taken Silk. Their formal title is Queen's Counsel or Senior Counsel. So if our friend Smith took Silk, he would be Mr Smith of Queen's Counsel. The final thing to know about barristers is that they almost never see the client directly. The client hires the solicitor and the solicitor briefs the barrister. Now I'm a barrister myself and it's entirely common for me to not even meet the actual client until the day of court. So hopefully that clarifies the distinction a little because now I'm going to make it a little bit more complicated. 
You see, in most jurisdictions in Australia, they have what they call a fused profession. So legal practitioners, once they're admitted to practice, are admitted as a solicitor and barrister. And there's theoretically no distinction between the two. However, old habits die hard. And even in the fused states, there's a tendency for a legal practitioner to either practice as a solicitor or as a barrister. So even though in theory, there's no distinction between the two, in practice, the distinction often remains. Finally, let's think about judicial officers. The first and most obvious type of judicial officer is a judge. For somebody to be a judge, though, has a special meaning. You see, once judges are appointed to the court, they usually serve either until they choose to resign or until they reach a specific age. In the Commonwealth, it's 70 years of age. Unless they are convicted of a serious crime or unless it's demonstrated that they've lost their capacity through, say, a mental illness, a judge cannot be sacked. Now, if you think about it, you'll see how important this is. Imagine if governments could simply sack judges who made decisions the government didn't like. Imagine if judges had to make rulings with half an eye on their popularity rather than on justice. What an awful, awful situation that would be. So we protect judges. All they need to consider is the case before them and its merits according to law. Judges are always referred to as your honour. The second type of judicial officer is a magistrate. Magistrates are very similar to judges. Traditionally, some magistrates were known were what is known as lay magistrates, meaning that they weren't actually lawyers. However, nowadays, virtually all magistrates are lawyers and they're appointed on essentially the same basis as judges. So they receive the same protections. And they are referred to as your honour. The third and final type of judicial officer for our purposes is a registrar. A registrar is one step below a magistrate or judge and they exercise certain powers which have been delegated to them by the court. Often those powers are very significant, but they tend to be in areas which are either preliminary or non-controversial. So your first appearance in a matter might be before the registrar, and the registrar will then determine whether the matter should proceed to a judge or a magistrate, and they might give directions about things that both sides have to do, such as disclosing documents. In the Federal Circuit Court, most divorces are actually granted by registrars. In court, you simply call a registrar, registrar. So if they ask you a question, the answer might be, yes, registrar. So now we know that because the legal profession is a profession, you can't just put up a sign and start practicing as a lawyer. Well, what do you need to do then in order to become a lawyer? First things first, you need to have a law degree and not just any law degree. For instance, there are Master of Laws degrees out there which are perfectly good ways to learn about the law, but which won't get you ready for practice. To be suitable, your law degree must include what are called the Priestly 11 subjects, named after Justice Priestley, who authored the report recommending that they be compulsory. They are Administrative Law, Civil Procedure, Constitutional Law, Corporations Law, Contracts, Criminal Law, equity and trusts, ethics, professional responsibility, evidence, property and torts. They form the basic knowledge that every lawyer should have. To get those subjects in, you're basically going to do a Bachelor of Laws, also known as an LLB, because of the Latin uh, words legum lex baccalaureate, which means Bachelor of Laws. Alternatively, some students obtain a Juris Doctor, which, despite its name, is not a doctorate. The final way is to do the Diploma of Law offered by the Law Extension Committee of the New South Wales Legal Practitioners Admissions Board. Now, once you've done your Bachelor of Laws or equivalent, there are still a few more hoops to jump through. First, you have to complete what is known as Practical Legal Training, or PLT. This usually involves some academic work, as well as spending some time in a law firm or legal practice undertaking supervised legal work. Once you've done that, you then need to apply to the Legal Practitioners Admission Board in your state or territory. And that will involve establishing that you are a suitable person to be allowed to practice law. Uh, if you have a criminal history, particularly including offences involving dishonesty, 
or if you've ever found, been found by your university to have committed academic misconduct, for instance, by cheating on an exam or by plagiarising someone else's work, well, then you may not be considered suitable for practice. Once you're through all of these hoops, the big day will arrive and you can go to your local Supreme Court, along with a practitioner who has the honour of proposing your admission to practice, and you can swear the oaths, sign the rolls, and you will be a legal practitioner. Now, a few minutes ago, I mentioned that one of the key attributes of a profession is that the professions are self-regulating. The solicitors and barristers must abide by a code of ethics which regulate their professional practice. You'll do a whole subject on this stuff later in your degree, but we're going to brush over a few of the key ethical principles now. First and foremost, every legal practitioner is what's known as an officer of the court. What that means from an ethical perspective is that a legal practitioner's duty, highest duty, is to the court, to help the court do justice. That duty is even higher than the practitioner's duty to the client. Everything else that we talk about here in terms of ethics fits into that framework. Your duty to the court, and therefore your duty to behave ethically, outranks your duty to the client. So first your duty to the court, then your duty to the client. Now the first duty to the court that I want to mention is the duty of candour. This has a number of aspects. First it means you can't lie to the court nor to your opponent. Now that'll come as a bit of a shock to some of you because you've probably absorbed some of those social views which suggest that lawyers constantly lie. It's just not true. It may well be that your client asserts certain facts as being true, while the other side's client asserts an entirely different set of facts as being true, and then you have a contest over those. But you can't outright lie. For instance, you can't tell your opponent that you've got photographic evidence of them trespassing on your property if, in fact, you've got no such thing. Similarly, you can't tell the court that your client was in Melbourne if you know they were in Brisbane. And you can't put a witness on the stand knowing that they intend to give false evidence either. There's another aspect to candour, and that is that you can't mislead the court about the law. So if you know of a case that the court ought to be considering, even if that case is against your interests, you have to bring that case to the attention of the court. You can't just sit back and let the court make an error of law just because that error happens to favour your client. A second duty to the court is what's called an undertaking. In essence, if you promise something to the court, then you have a special duty to deliver on that promise. So, if you undertake to the court to supply a particular document within three days, well then you're under a special obligation to do so. This in turn means that nobody should ever give an undertaking that relies on a third party. So for instance, if your client has a document, you would be unwise to give an undertaking that you will file the document in court the next day. Because what if the client lets you down? You'd then be in the position of failing in your undertaking, even though you personally wouldn't have done anything wrong. A third duty to the court is a duty that's most often expressed in terms of barristers. But it's really, really relevant to solicitors too. Barristers have a rule called the cab rank rule. It's based on the idea that if you have taxis lined up at a cab rank, the driver at the front of the rank has to take whichever customer comes his or her way. So they might end up taking a $10 fare while the cab behind them gets a $50 fare. It's just luck of the draw. They can't sit there picking and choosing. Well, for barristers, if a brief or a case is offered to them, and if they're available, and if they don't have a conflict of interest, and they're competent in that area of law, and their usual fee can be paid, then they must take the case. No matter how horrible or reprehensible the client is, no matter whether it's a case they can win or one they're destined to lose, no matter the nature of the charge or the claim, it's one of the central rules of the barrister's profession. Under the cab rank rule, I myself have represented lovely people who I really wanted to help. And I've also represented people accused of awful crimes. And I've done my very best to work hard for each client and to respect them and to put their case 
as well as I can. And in each case, I've been instructed by a solicitor who did exactly the same thing I did. Solicitors are not bound by the cab rank rule, but many solicitors act as though they were. And many of your friends, when they find out you're studying law, will ask you, but how can you possibly defend those who've committed horrible crimes? Well, we do that because our first duty is to justice and the court, not to the client. And justice and the court follow three relevant principles. The first one you've all heard of. Everyone is presumed innocent until they are proven guilty. If we as lawyers refuse to represent someone in court because of the charges against them, well, aren't we denying them that presumption of innocence? Second, and taking that theme just a little further, it's supposed to be the judge and the jury who determine someone's guilt or innocence. If lawyers decided whether someone was guilty or innocent rather than letting the courts do so, well, doesn't that just make us some sort of awful legal lynch mob? Third, the judge and the jury can only make their decision based on the cases that have been presented to them. That's how our legal system works in Australia. So imagine if all lawyers just said, nope, we're not going to represent the guilty clients, particularly those facing horrible charges. Well, the result of that would be that those people would appear before the courts without any representation. They'd have to do their best to try and present their case without any help at all. You know what the result would be? I can almost guarantee that the result would be innocent people being convicted and punished because they lacked the ability to effectively stand up for themselves. So much for the main duties to the court. What about our duties to the client? Because although the duties to the court come first, our duties to the client remain crucial. The first one is what we call client professional privilege. People used to prefer to this as legal professional privilege and sometimes you might still see it referred to that way. Basically the idea is that anything that a client tells you and which is connected with you providing them with legal advice or preparing for litigation is privileged information. You have an obligation to keep that material confidential and you can't even be required by a court to give that information up. It's important to understand, however, that the privilege belongs to the client. So the client, at any time, can either tell other people what happened in your confidential communications, or they can instruct or permit you to do so. Client professional privilege is absolutely crucial to our system of law because, as lawyers, we can only do our job if the client feels absolutely confident of their ability to tell us whatever they like, whatever they need to without the fear that the things they tell us will be revealed to others. And most importantly, that we won't be revealing those things to our clients' opponents. Client professional privilege allows free and open communication between lawyers and our clients. The second key duty to our client is that as lawyers, we must follow all of our clients' lawful and proper instructions. You see, we are legal advisors, not legal directors. And ultimately, it's the client, not us, that has to live with the consequences of any legal dispute. What that means is that sometimes our clients will listen to our advice and then ignore it and instead make absurd decisions. We will advise them to settle and they'll choose to fight it out. Or we'll advise them that the case against them is very strong and they'll plead not guilty anyway. Or we'll advise that we think they can get them more time with the kids, but they'll settle for what's on offer. Once we have instructions, we put those instructions to the court and our opponent. You can't go outside your instructions, no matter what. Win or lose, we get to walk away with our fees paid. The client has to deal with the consequences. So the client should be the one making all the big calls. The third key duty to our clients is to ensure that we are not under any conflict of interest in relation to the matter. That means, in essence, that we've, if we've provided advice to the other side in the past, well, then we shouldn't provide advice to this client now. Because when we're providing advice to the other client in the past, we would have learned about them. And knowing those things might change the nature of the advice that we give the current client, and that's not fair. How can clients speak to their lawyer openly and honestly 
if they feel like there's a chance that anything they say might come back to bite them in some later proceeding if the same lawyer is against them. In the same way, if the lawyer themselves has an interest in the case, it's usually best for that lawyer not to be involved. So let's say a client wants to sue the garage where my son works as a mechanic in relation to some repairs. Well, you can see that I might not be considered impartial in that situation. So the best thing for me to do would be to stand aside and let someone else have the case. Finally, a lawyer should be very careful about advising more than one party in a dispute. Sometimes lawyers might actually do this, but it has to be done with the greatest of care and with everyone's agreement. And you can only represent two parties if their interests are identical. If they end up with different legal interests, then you have to withdraw altogether and it gets very messy indeed. So for instance, let's say you're representing a married couple who sustained injuries in a car crash and they're suing the driver of the other car. Well, at first it looks pretty reasonable to represent both of them. But then if it turns out that the husband was driving and he'd had a few drinks, suddenly they stand in different legal positions, don't they? Because she might well be blameless and he might not be. At that point, all you can really do is step out of the picture. What you must not do is allow yourself to become mired in a conflict. If you think there's even a chance that others might consider you have a conflict, then the best thing to do is to step aside. There are a couple of other things to think about. They're not quite ethical issues, but they're in the same ballpark. The first one I want to mention is courtesy. You see, lawyers work in an adversarial environment. We go in and fight for our clients. But there have to be limits. We're all members of the same profession and we're all officers of the court. We need to be able to put our instructions firmly and vigorously but without getting into the game of treating our colleagues like enemies. One way in which we do this, particularly in the world of barristers, but also among the better solicitors, is by being extremely careful about courtesy to one another. Courtesy to other practitioners is a signal that you are advocating for your client the best that you possibly can, but also that you thoroughly respect your colleague on the other side and the court as a whole. There's just about nothing as unsightly, as disappointing and frankly as embarrassing as seeing two lawyers who've taken their client's dispute and turned it into their own dispute. Courtesy in our profession is not just a matter of being nice. It's a way to keep our professional sanity in a workplace that is sometimes built around conflict. Finally, I want to speak briefly about pro bono and public interest lawyering. As I mentioned earlier, pro bono cases are cases where lawyers take on work either for free or for a substantially reduced fee. This includes private firms that take on pro bono clients. It includes community legal services like the community legal centres, the prisoners legal service or the women's legal centre. It also includes services specifically set up to do work for clients who can't afford to pay like legal aid, Salvo's legal humanitarian, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Service. It includes barristers who often appear either free of charge or for legal aid rates which are way below normal commercial rates. Finally, it includes lawyers who join organisations dedicated to the public good, whether it be in the area of human rights or the environment or refugees or anything else really. People mock lawyers, but our profession does work worth millions of dollars a year for free or at a big discount. It's something to be proud of. And working hard for a pro bono client, doing the case as well as you would if they were paying top dollar, well, that's a sign of a true professional. A professional who understands not only the law and how to practice the law, but also what our profession owes to the community that we support. Right now, as law students, you will be welcome to volunteer with community legal centres. Go and ask how you can help. And throughout your whole legal career, there are very few things you could ever do which are quite so worthwhile as pro bono work. So there's a bit about being a lawyer. Many of you, once you've finished studying the law, will go in other directions and not practice. And that's okay. You're still part of this profession. And there's still a contribution for you to make. People hate lawyers right up until the very moment they need us.